A young woman born into a politically active family shares her story of growing up in Iran through the Islamic Revolution, her time in Europe, and her return home. The woman, Marjan Satrapi, the book, The Complete Persepolis, and you're listening to Lit Society. Let's get lit! lit! Alexis and this is Kari and you're listening to Lit Society a show about books and drama <laughs> yep how you doing today Kari how's your I'm week good. been yeah it was good I got a lot of cleaning and stuff done I'm still not hanging out I know a lot of people are just going out you know risking risking it all for a good risking time. it all risking it <laughs> all I'm gonna wait to see what happened to them and then maybe <laughs> I'll kick it like all the time <laughs> I think everybody is um, waiting for that group. I know at our job, um, some people, they opened it up. I guess we're in, um, we're going back in stages. And so they said only 25% of our office could come back. And that equals like 60 people and only 15 people, 15 to 20 people are have come back already. So smart, it's like yeah. people are waiting. They're not eager to get back to the office. It doesn't sound mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh. What about you? How was your weekend or week? How's my your weekend? weekend? I mean, it's Thursday. Yeah, uh, my week has been uh, off to a good start. Well, it's almost the end, but, you know, it's been off to a good start. <laughs> um, I have nothing to complain about. I was going to tell you something, but I can't remember what it is. I know I got to write a note. It'll come I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm, I'm there, girl. <laughs> 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 so uh, it's summer and now I'm really yeah. nervous about missing the summer yeah yes Girl. spring is gone that's over that ain't gonna happen again but summer's almost here and i need a rooftop nah. or two nope i'm like past i'm ready to stay inside the whole summer i'm hermit. okay with that we know that now uh, yes <laughs> i just might <laughs> never see you again <laughs> in person. i have decided that that is exactly what it is so i'm glad you said it out loud because i have yeah, been no thinking that. i said i'm i'm really a hermit <laughs> I'm going to stay in the house. I'm going to own that. I'm going to run with it. There That's you go. what I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it has been hot outside. Yeah. Though, right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm really it's feeling it in the department. You what? I've been feeling it in this apartment. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, yes. I need to put air. I need to put the air unit in the window. But I usually have the maintenance guy come and do it. And um, I've just been too lazy to just dial the number. <laughs> well, I got central air. My air been on since January. <laughs> I even let the window open so I get a little breeze with the central air. You know, my bill be high. Whatever. <laughs> hey, hey. Anyway, let's get moving. Let's get started on this week, okay? okay. All right. <laughs> Each week, readers, we select a theme to discuss inspired by the book that we're reading. This week's theme is how to survive a disaster. So, Kari. Yeah. Did you know that there was a National Disaster Preparedness Month? No, I've never heard of that. Guess which month it is. <laughs> this month we're in, is it June? No, why would you uh, say June? What? It better not be February, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> what month is it? <laughs> Actually, it's September. <laughs> September okay. is National Disaster Preparedness Month. It's organized by ready.com, excuse me, Ready. Dot gov, which is a national public service campaign designed to empower and educate the American people to prepare for, respond to, and mitigate emergencies, including natural and man-made disasters. It's actually an official website of the Department of Homeland Security. The, re- the website lists a lot of um, possible emergencies. It includes bioterrorism, explosions, active shooters, house fires, it lists everything. So check out the website. It's um, very informative. What happens during this National Disaster Preparedness Month? Well, each week they have a different topic to cover and they provide related resources. I'm not sure if they change these topics from year to year, but the September 2019 program was themed prepared, not scared. And the schedule was outlined like this. Week one, they discuss save early um 
save early for disaster costs. Week two, make a plan to prepare for disasters. Week three, teach youth to prepare for disasters. And then week four, get involved in your community's preparedness. Each week, they would provide resources related to the topic. For example, during week one, save early for disaster costs. They suggest checking your insurance coverage, um, planning financially for a possible disaster, and then um, completing an emergency financial first aid kit. I've never heard of that. So I was. No, um, me neither. It's a lot um, based on finances. Yeah. I and mean, then you got to be ready the, if you broke, too. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Yeah. They even list their social media posts on the site as well. So um, they go um, they have a link that you can click in. that talks more about that emergency financial first aid kit. It's, a, it's I repeat, it's a great resource. But then I came across a Huffington Post article called 10 Disaster Preparedness Tips That You Can Really Use. And this is from December 2017. And so I'm going to tell you all about these top 10s, okay? Can I just say, I love how this theme relates to the book. Go ahead. <laughs> are, you, are you mocking me? No, I'm enthralled. Okay. I'm not even, I hope I don't sound facetious. I'm being so serious. Please, please continue. And let okay. me get a notepad. <laughs> Number one, know what you'll face. So we want to be aware of the type of disasters that happen in our area. Hurricanes usually happen in coastal areas. So if you're in Montana, you probably don't need to worry about that. If you live in California, you got to be ready for earthquakes. And I'd say you got to be um, ready for earthquakes in the Midwest because we felt them on this end of the earth as well. Yeah, we're long overdue for a big one. Yeah. <clears throat> um, severe weather can happen anywhere. So you never want to overlook it. And we already know that we can all be affected by a pandemic flu. So. The article says no one lives in a disaster free zone. So if you think if you can't think of any possibilities that could happen in your area, the Red Cross has a list. The goal is to be mentally prepared by acknowledging yeah, the harder. fact that. Yeah. By acknowledging the fact that something can happen and I need to be prepared. Number yeah. two, learn your area's evacuation routes and shelter locations. You don't want to wait to figure these out. Um, the day the warning comes or the day to tor a few minutes before the uh, tornado announcement comes, you want to know in advance. You want to know you escape have routes from your home. You have shelter locations in your neighborhood? I don't know. I have to look into that. <laughs> well, don't wait till the last minute, preacher. Practice exactly, what you preach. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so for a tornado, for a tornado, if I, you know, if I was in the house in a tornado, I would get in my bathtub. Go to the basement. So, oh, so, but yeah, I don't right. really have a basement. So um, I would go in the bathroom and yeah, I'd go in the bathroom. Anyway, because you're so going to be so your... scared. That's probably the perfect room to be in. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Ooh, I found the right That's... chair. For my demise. Okay, go. in the bathtub. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so know the escape routes from your home. So how to get out? Okay. So windows, like for a fire, um, I would go out my front window if that's at all possible. I plan to get one of those, um, um, you know, window ladders. ladders. Like, yeah, a window ladder. Yeah, as an escape yeah. route. And and if you have children. Draw a map and post it near a door. Then plan a meetup spot outside your home, even outside your neighborhood, just in case your area is evacuated. Decide ahead of time and rehearse your escape plan. Now, I don't know if they want me to be rehearsing, climbing out the window, but I'm <laughs> on a rope ladder. And what yeah. if that brings you in? How ironic. <laughs> you was prepared for disaster. <laughs> and by doing so, you brought your own disaster. Ooh, the irony. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. <laughs> but that's number two, folks. <laughs> number three, know how you'll reconnect with family or um, people who matter. Okay, so what if the cell phone, the cell networks aren't working? How are you going to let people know that you're okay? So the Red Cross recommends using an out-of-area emergency contact to have family members um, check in. Since it may be easier to make a long-distance call or send a text message. Um, everyone should have a list of emergency contacts and then a local emergency numbers. There's more information for sure on the ready.com, excuse me, ready.gov website. Number four, sign up for emergency alerts 
and know how officials will communicate with you during a disaster. These you can get through your cell phone. Kari, are you signed up to get updates from your local government? I hope I'm signed up not to get the updates. I'm sure if it's truly something I need to know, you would tell me. <laughs> I'm also on Twitter. <laughs> but this is good advice. Go ahead. Okay. That is actually the best way to learn about emergencies if you're um, constantly, you know, connected to your phone. The emergency broadcast system also broadcasts over the radio and television. And then you can also get like a NOAA radio um, weather radio which can tell you about severe weather 24 seven. And if you use social media, you can get updates that way, but don't um, rely on that as your main source, just in case you don't have access to the internet. Tip five, learn what to do if you're caught away from home. So there used to be a time when we were always in our office, our work location, wherever that may be. And for many, this has changed. So in any event, We need to be prepared to react to a disaster from different locations. So I remember when I used to go into the office, we had a plan and then we would do these kind of practice sessions every year where we go to the area, um, the meetup location in the event of uh, an emergency. And then we also had these uh, personal emergency kits and the kits had like some basics. They had an evacuation route. Um, a kind of a communication plan, what we're supposed to do, and then um, where we're supposed to go in the event of the emergency, okay? So we need to have this as a fan, excuse me, whenever we're at um, a location other than our home, the basics, again, the evacuation route, a communication plan, and then how you'll receive the mer- emergency notifications, and then a plan for connecting with your family. And if you have children, Talk to the school about their plan. Step tip six. Keep saying step, but they're tips. Okay. Have a kit and know how to use it. Emergency kits with some basic necessities, food, water, basic first aid supplies, and other emergency equipment like flashlights and duct tape. FEMA has a full list and you can also get information from ready.gov that I mentioned at the beginning. The key is to have these items all together in one location, a bag, and not scattered all over your home. You can purchase these kits pre-packed. Yeah, one bag that you can grab and run with. Yeah. Also, make sure you know how to use the items in the bag. Do you have your (laughs) bag ready, Kari? I do. Both my husband and I have a bag where if we get separated, everything we need to survive for about a week is in that bag. And, you know, I got chicken. I got ramen noodles. (laughs) I got liquor. No, (laughs) no. Actually, I bought rations from Amazon and these are like army grade rations. I heard they Uh taste pretty good, too, but they last for, I think, about three years. So we have that. Um, and it's a, it's a supply for three days. Um, then I have ramen noodles in case I get access to some boiling water. It's going to be like college (laughs) and I'm going to make it work. Um, I have a radio that you can hand crank and Mm -hmm. it's also a flashlight. I have a lighter, um, that doesn't, um, it's an electric lighter, so it doesn't have like fluid inside. Um, and it's waterproof. All of our documents are in a waterproof pouch. Um, yeah, and first aid kit, of course, which I mean, I don't know how to use. That's like, but I figure if I need to use it, I, all that stuff in it would make complete sense. Like I would be like, oh, this is what gauze is for. My amputated leg. Perfect. Saved it. Do, Sutured. Do you, do you know how to use your crank radio, though? Yeah, you crank it. What? Yeah. So, I mean, you yeah, still you turn need to it make for sure a you know how to do it. Until your arm hurt and then you can turn it on and maybe you'll get, I don't know, Desperate Housewives. Oh, well, what's on the radio? Who knows? Who knows? (laughs) Yeah, but to answer your question, yes. And I got a to go back for my kitty. So if I got, because that's the next one. Go ahead, share it. So, okay. So, so we have, um, we have different packs based on the emergency and the time that we have to escape. So if I have like 30 seconds or less, I'm getting my bag and I'm going. My cat and unfortunately my husband might not make it. And I have enough to rebuild my life. (laughs) But if I have at least one minute, I can get my bag and my cat. And I throw her in it and it comes with. um, Now, I have a totally indoor cat. That's okay. I have a box um, that is her quote unquote litter box. 
and it comes with this like clumping self clumping litter that's all uh-huh. very flat it's all very flat and it all fits in one little um reusable bag so if i need to i can take her food throw her in her own carrier and grab that bag and we're okay. set okay the producer mm-hmm. shall be saved yes. yes our producer zara would still make it and okay. then we could go on without my husband, unfortunately. <laughs> but he got his own bag, so he should have been gone. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Ooh, <laughs> Just Ooh. kidding. We would save him. We would wait oh, for at okay. least 30 seconds. At okay, least 30 seconds. Mm. <laughs> okay, so this tip, this is on tip eight. It says, it actually says, never leave your pet behind. I'm um, trying to that. evacuate your pet to a friend or a family member's home as they may not be allowed in public shelters. Keep a um, pet emergency kit and food. And you mentioned yours and other important items. Also, if you don't already, um, make sure you get your pet's microchip so they can be returned to you in the event they're lost. That's why you um, should get your pet from a shelter so they can already it. come microchips. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The microchipping also has your animal records. So that way, if you have to board in an emergency shelter, um, all that information is available. Ready.com has more information about making a plan that for your pet. She keeps saying dot com. She, Ooh, just, she Lord, came my breath yes. over here. <sighs> Ready.gov. Yes, yes. <laughs> Tip number nine. Learn <laughs> emergency skills that can always come in handy. Learn how to use a fire extinguisher or perform basic first aid. Get trained in CPR. You can always learn how to shut off utilities in your home in case of a disaster that may damage gas, water, or electrical lines. I um, did get some training and basic first aid and fire extinguisher usage, but both trainings have expired. So I got a little memory of it. I just, um, I'm not certified trained. Sure. How about you? Do you have any such trainings? No, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know how you um extinguish a fire? You don't. You run. <laughs> run away from it. <laughs> Wait, but what if it's just on the stove or you know, oh well. in a bath? You just go run. That's a shame. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what insurance is. Just for. as long as we're clear. Long as we're clear. Okay. Uh <laughs> and our final tip. Find out how you can help your community during a disaster. Learn how to become a community leader during a disaster or teach others how to be prepared. You can volunteer at local emergency response agencies or at a nonprofit. So, Cara, do you have anything to add to the list? No, I think this is brilliant. And I feel like this is advice I am going to use one day. So I'll store this away. Yeah. Okay. As a reminder, You can get this information or more information about preparing for a disaster at ready.gov, the redcross.org, or your local emergency preparedness site. Let's take a quick break before we get into the details surrounding this week's book, The Complete Persepolis. All right. background on Marjane Satrapi and maybe some context around in the book. Please forgive me the pronunciation Marjane of her Satrapi, name. Marjane Satrapi, I got you. So born <laughs> in 1969 um, in Iran, Marjane Satrapi is a graphic novelist, cartoonist, illustrator, film director, and child's book author who came of age during her country's Islamic revolution and war with Iraq. Um, Satrapi was be- a beloved only child of very progressive parents in relation to their neighbors and people they knew. Um, They were upper upper middle class, I think, maybe even upper class. The dad was Mm -hmm. an engineer and the mom was in fashion. I think she was a clothing designer. In 1984, her parents sent her to school in Austria to escape what they saw as the oppressive regime of Iran. Persepolis is the story of her childhood. Its name comes from Perse and Opolis in Greek. So Perse meaning Persian and Opolis meaning city or Persian city. And that was the name Iran was given in Greek. Um, So that is also kind of symbolic of the story within of this old and new um, evolving into something else. Mm. Oh, also, Mm. I want to share some historical context because I don't know about you, but I mean, for me, I don't I didn't embarrassingly I am embarrassed to admit if you told me something happened in Iran, Iraq or Afghanistan, 
for me, you could be speaking about the same place. And that is so ignorant because I understand that each location has its own culture. And I mean, geographical place in the world. (laughs) Like this Uh is not at all the same area. So um, this book really opened my eyes to a lot of history that I was ignorant about. Um, I did know that before Greece, Rome and the Anglo-American power, um, Iran or Persia was the dominant world power. Mm -hmm. Um, You know that. Right. Did you know a lot about the political climate of this part of the world, like specifics or about the culture? I'm going to say I didn't know a lot um, about the specifics, but I knew that there was war there. I knew they were um, separate places. Um, I I knew a little bit, not a whole lot. And so I appreciate the education that the book gave in that sense. Same, same. And that's all I knew. Well, in the 20th century, um, oil was discovered and the West, specifically Great Britain and the Amer- and uh, the U.S., uh, the West's interest in the area grew. World, World War II, we always have problems with that. <laughs> World War II, the Allies asked Iran to join them. But Reza Shah, the Shah is the title of the ruler, um, like a king or emperor or president. Um, so Reza Shah, the father of the last Shah of Iran, sympathized with the Germans. So he declared his country, Iran, a neutral zone. The Allies invaded and occupied Iran in retaliation. The Shah was exiled and replaced with his son, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. In 1951, Mohammad uh, Mosday, PM of Iran, and I hope I'm saying his name correctly, uh, who was appointed at the approval of the Shah, nationalized oil. And what that means is... Um, So oil was discovered in Iran. Everybody wanted it. And it was Mm -hmm. mostly um, the people who profited from this was mostly the um, Anglo-Iranian oil company. So the PM, the prime minister said, nope, the government is going to own this and we're going to take your private property and ideally distribute it, distribute the wealth to the people. So that's what the nationalization of oil means. In retaliation, the CIA, and this is public knowledge, this is Mm -hmm. not um, politically sided or partisan. The reta- in re- retaliation, the CIA organized a coup against the prime minister, okay, in 1953. The Shah at the time, again, um, Muhammad, who was the son of the uh, first Shah or the Shah that we spoke about, fled, leaving the prime minister alone for better or worse. At first, the coup was a series of failures. It didn't work, but eventually it did succeed and the prime minister was overthrown. The Shah returned and he remained in power until 1979, 1979, when he fled from the Islamic Revolution. And his abdication was the end of like 2,500 years of Persian monarchs. It was just it. Um, The Islamic Revolution took hold. And today, today, Iran is an Islamic Republic officially. So it's during this time that Marjan is growing up during this trading of hands. Well, thank you for that. I, um, that's one piece I really appreciated about this uh, book is the little history lesson that it gave. I can't think of anywhere where I might have learned that, um, but I do remember news reports kind of that told me a little bit about it. Well, I never went searching for this um, public information. I never had a strong interest in it, so I didn't read up on it. So I'm a big news watcher, as you know. <laughs> so I would have just got it from the news. And that seems bit. that can be biased sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. But this 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 revealed that truth. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. This book revealed yeah. that, the truth behind that. So, it's so important to read um, stories like this from the people who actually live there. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thanks for sharing that. Why don't we get a brief synopsis with no spoilers? Okay, I repeat, no spoilers. (laughs) No problem. Well, this is nonfiction, so it's hard to spoil a book of nonfiction. But a brief synopsis being very careful not to give anything away. Persepolis is the story of a girl growing up in a time of war and revolution. Together, she and her country must decide who they're supposed to be and who they actually are. Oh. He wasn't paying attention. That was nice. See? I mean, it was like brief too. Your last few ones were really like brief. really yeah. long. <laughs> Thanks. So, Alexis, what were your first thoughts of Persepolis? Okay, so I didn't know anything about the book. As usual, you throw these books out there and you be like, let's read this. I'm like, okay. But I do remember you said it was a comic book and novel um, format. And I'm like, um, what does that mean? So... <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. Uh, or I a nonfiction watched, comic book. 
Yeah. Like, what I, in the world? Yeah. What in the world? Um, so I, I didn't really know what to expect. That's all I can really say. I didn't, didn't really have any first thoughts as a, I don't know what I'm going to be reading, but let's give it a try. It's what also were your movie. first? Yeah. What were your first thoughts? Um, I've been looking for a comic book that isn't aggressively like violent for us to feature because mm-hmm. that's not what we're into. But right. um, so, so this is like the only one I found. Listeners, if you have another suggestion, please let me know. Um, but yeah, that's actually just why I chose it. Nothing more. I just wanted a graphic novel. And then when I saw that it was a nonfiction graphic novel, I was very interested. So that's it. I Googled it, found it, decided to read it. Not you know, a really I, amazing story. I heard that. Um, so the guy that did the TEDx talk, he said most graphic novels are memoirs. Did, have you heard that? No. Yeah, that's what he said. So I thought that was um, truly very interesting. All right. So you ready for the deep dive? I am. Um, all right. So let's get all this diving deep. and You can provide everything there is to tell about this story. Okay. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Coming, coming, coming. It. Here we go. A deep dive into Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi. Uh, growing up, Marjan wanted to be a prophet. Uh, Her grandmother asked her, how will you arrange for old people not to suffer? It will simply be forbidden, she said. (laughs) So you are getting the idea that this is a child who's very much loved and humored by her mom, dad and grandmother. And she loves them whole lots. Her father one day tells her that she's old enough to know about her grandfather. He was the son of the overthrown emperor. He was named prime minister by the Shah because the Shah's entourage was uneducated and her grandpa was knowledgeable. He was an educated man. But grandpa became a communist and was often imprisoned. And the ideas of Marx are popular amongst a lot of sects of people um, during this time. And I mean, like, since forever. So the family suffered her family and was often without food even. According to Marjan's grandmother, the father of the Riza Shah was bad. But his son, who's currently ruling when we hear this story, was even worse. The people eventually revolted and the Shah fled to Egypt. The children were taught that God chose the Shah in school. But when he abdicated, they were told to rip his picture out of their school books. This left Marjan confused. Like, is he chosen by God or he ain't? She's yeah, that's kind of hard to, um, you know, that's hard for children how do you say you've you've blended church and state to make me believe that the current ruler is indeed a representative of almighty right here on earth but as soon as he leaves his throne we're to rip his page his face out of our books like i I didn't even like him like that but that don't make no sense (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah that's how he was god so yeah so what's up what's really up what's Mm -hmm. really good so marjan's dad uh seems upper class as we said before and he drives a cadillac while a lot of people you know walk everywhere and this kind of brings shame on marjan she hates the disparity between the classes even at a young age her mom marjan's mom speaks freely with her husband family strangers and she dresses as she pleases she acts like a quote-unquote liberated woman they have a maid and a comfortable life with many family members and friends. Uh, Marjan even attends a French immersion school, it sounds like. But yeah. soon after the Shah is forced out, foreign schools are closed. Also, people hoping to insert themselves in history lie about the part they played in the revolution. Their next door neighbor, for example, got an ugly mark on her face and her husband go around <laughs> talking about her face was grazed by a bullet. She's a hero. <laughs> And Marjan's mom is like, that woman always had that ugly mark on her face. I can't believe these little liars. <laughs> um, if someone's father killed a lot of his countrymen during this revolution, this battle, the children defend their parents. Um, and th- their parents may have massacred their own people, but the children just repeat what was uh, what they were told at home. Yeah. So there's a friend that Marjan has whose father uh, massac- massacred many people. And so Marjan Almost innocently. This is dark. She's like, hey, guys, let's go put nails in our hands and beat up this kid because his dad is a murderer. Where did she get that from? Where? It is dark. And her mom hears this and is like, how about I pin your, you know, nail your ears to the wall? Would you be happy about that? You have to forgive that little boy. And she goes, fine. So she goes to the boy and she's like, I forgive you because, you know, your daddy a murderer. And he's like, my dad ain't no murderer. He did what was right. He killed communists. 
And um, Marshawn is like shocked. Like I forgived you and you still bad. <laughs> so during this period of her life, she feels very holy. <laughs> She Very. wants to be a prophet. She feels like God comes and hangs out with her all the time. They're like yeah. best friends. And, you know, some people are just not as holy as her. <laughs> Eventually, 3,000 political prisoners are released. Marjan's family knew um, two of them, for example, Siamak and Mosin. When he was imprisoned, uh, Marjane told Siamak's daughter that her father was dead. <laughs> The little girl was like, my daddy's away on a trip. And my was your like, daddy dead. he dead, girl. He it's dead. time to mourn so we can go play. He did. <laughs> yeah, but he came home. So Marjan was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I'm not even going to deal with you no more. And the little you, girl was like, yeah, we ain't friends and we ain't never going to be friends. friends. You could just go, you know, take a long walk off a short clip. Go on now. So... <laughs> One day, Marjane's family had over CMAC's family and Motion because Motion and CMAC um, were in prison together, uh, coincidentally. And the two men sh- share stories of their torture. They were stripped, urinated on, whipped, and burned with hot irons. Their friend, a friend of theirs, another man, endured all of this only to be chopped in pieces in the mm-hmm. end, into pieces. And this is the part where I should actually say some of uh, the story, while we're not going to tell it in a very graphical, graphic and detailed way, just the nature of it is violent. It's dealing with war. So please keep that in mind. Um, moving on, Marjan was sad because her dad never went to prison and was never tortured and therefore wasn't a hero. <laughs> oh, baby. She's like, man, what did you do, daddy? Yeah, Dang, exactly. you're just living the life, driving a Cadillac. I'm so ashamed. Yeah. But fortunately, she learned about her uncle, Anoush. Anoush spent years in prison, but was released and reunited with his family. Um, his brother, which is Marjan's dad, and his mother, which is Marjan's grandmother, of course. He instantly falls in love with Marjan and treats her like his own daughter. He would share his story with her like, as like a bedtime story. Yeah. And she relished each and every moment, no matter how uh, dark it was at times. She, she loved talking to this uncle. He really opened up this world to her, the truth about what was going on. Uh, it seemed his wife, who was Russian, would not allow him to see his own daughters. So he really replaced them with Marjan in his heart. Anoush had joined his uncle in revolting against the Shah back in the day fighting for what he considered independence. Anusha's father disowned him because Anusha's father was loyal to the Shah. But one day his uncle was captured and Anush had to return to his parents. When he re- arrived, he was cold and hungry, having hiked for days over mountains through snow. His father and mother accepted him back. They weren't cold hearted people, but it was unsafe for them as long as he was there. So he swam to Russia. That's crazy. Insane. He swam to the USSR. There he was married and had two children, as we already mentioned, two girls. He later separated from his wife and was lonely constantly. So he decided to return home in disguise. That disguise didn't work because he was captured at the airport. Um, After being captured, though, backing up a little bit, Anusha's uncle, the one that Anusha had left his family to follow, was visited by his girlfriend who paid the guard to leave them alone. While he's in prison, his final night, Anusha's uncle's girlfriend, follow me, Wanted to conceive his baby in prison before he died. She yep. had the child. Yeah. Yeah. She had the child in Switzerland. It's a boy and he looks just like his father. Um, back to Anoush and his disguise. So it didn't work. He was caught at the airport and imprisoned for nine years. Nine years for even thinking of revolting against the Shah. Um, a boy Marjane likes later on moves to the U.S. with his family. She's heartbroken. A good portion of her family also leaves. So people are kind of seeing the climate and escaping yeah. before it gets too crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, um, her father, Marjan's father, believes that all of them will return eventually. They're just scared of change. So the Shah is out of here. Good things are to come. We just have to wait. That's how her dad feels. Soon they get a call. Motion, or Mosin. Remember um, the friend that came over? who was tortured in prison. That's right. Mosin. He was one mm-hmm. of them. Well, they get a call and he's drowned in his own bathtub. When they found him, only his head was in the tub. Obviously it was a murder. Right. The uncle comforts Marjan saying everything will be okay. They then find that Siamak, remember the little girl who Marjan was like, your daddy dead. And he wasn't, mm-hmm. 
Well, Sia Mac and his whole family. Well, first his sister was some guard showed up. Some people showed up at his home and executed his sister. He escaped with his family, however, across the border by crawling and hiding among a flock of sheep. This is how the former revolutionaries became the sworn enemies of the Islamic Republic. One day, Marjan's uncle doesn't pick her up from school and she's told he went back to Moscow to his wife. But she thinks, "Uh uh-uh, I know my uncle. He don't even speak to his wife. Somebody lying. She's like, that don't even make sense. Don't even make sense. Back it up. Tell me the truth. It turns out he's in prison. And he can only have one visitor. Guess who he picks? Oh, Marjan. He picks the baby. Oh. And he tells her, point blank to her face, that she is the little girl he always wanted, the star oh. of his life. He gives her a swan he carved out of bread. He is soon executed. The trip. Fundamentalist students take over the U.S. embassy. Now there's no way in Iran for anybody to get a U.S. visa. So even if they wanted to go to the U.S., which they kind of did, even if just for a vacation, they can't. Marjan thinks of that boy who left that she kind of like she a little girl. and She's like, oh, no, I'm so sad. She may never see him again or her family that have moved to the U.S. The universities are then closed for two years by the government who believes the school books are filled with decadence. And kudos to this book for using decadence in an appropriate way. Can I just say as a copywriter, when people say chocolate <laughs> is decadent, it fills me with such rage. So oh, and the that's family fears. Used. I don't know any Man. other words to- to describe uh, that people use to describe chocolate decadence you guys you don't want to eat anything that's decadent (laughs) come on the family fears that the country is going backwards one day her mom's car breaks down and marjan and her dad go to pick her mom up her mom comes running to them with tears this would have scared every you know scared me to death Uh two fundamentalist men had told her mom that she should be thrown against the wall and sexually assaulted and then thrown in the garbage her mom is physically ill for days. Did you get the feeling that an assault did occur? I thought for a second that it did, but I, I don't think it actually happened. I don't either because of her actions later. I mean, she was sad for a few days, but this didn't seem to shape the rest of her life or anything. Right, right. Um, so it does seem like they just threatened her. Still, you know, that's that really disturbed huge, her though. Mom. It's, yeah. That's disturbing. Two men. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The government then declares, not because of this, but just because they wanted to, the government declares the veil to be mandatory because there are rapists out here and we don't want our women to be raped. Sorry to use that word so casually. Um, Women's hair excites men too much. Women who wore mini skirts from this day forward (laughs) um, two years ago, for, for example, are now completely covered from head to toe in a black veil. Marjan is told if anyone asks, say you pray all day. Okay, all you do is pray. <laughs> and she's like, pray. fine, I can lie. <laughs> it's a lie, right my parents share. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what you eat for breakfast? I pray. Because Marjan is cool. <laughs> she's so funny. <laughs> now we said her parents were considered progressives. Well, they take her to a protest against the fundamental mentalists. And it was here that she saw violence for the first time with her own eyes. People getting stabbed. Um, people beat. They never went to a protest again. Knowing that vacations would soon be obsolete, her family went on a trip to Europe for three weeks. It was amazing, she says. On television in Spain, the news showed a black cloud over Iran, um, but they didn't really know what was going on. They didn't speak Spanish. Later, they find the country was at war with Iraq and Saddam Hussein. All the generals and fighter pilots, though, were in prison because of the failed coup. So the government releases them to fight against the Iraqis. The men agree on the one condition that the government would play the currently banned national anthem on television. Half of the pilots are killed in battle, including uh, the father of one of Marjan's schoolmates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marjan's mom's childhood friend. (laughs) So, uh, you know, follow us. This is like play auntie lives in a neighborhood that was bombed. They were wealthy and lived in a home draped in marble. It was so nice that Marjan's family went to visit them on vacation. (laughs) That's how nice the house was. It was like a resort, but they had nothing now but a handful of jewelry. Everything was gone. Their countrymen looked at people from their area as refugees. So it's like saying that um, for Chicago, let's say Gary, Indiana, there's a bomb, unfortunately, and people from Gary moved to Chicago and we start looking down on them. Although we're all Americans right. and we start saying things like they're going to take all our resources. And I heard their women are loose. Now we got to watch our husbands. Why don't they go back to where they came from when really they like next door? 
Um, the teacher at school, at Marjan's school, showed the students how to beat themselves twice a day in honor of the martyrs who had died in the war. So they would have to beat their chest, these little girls. And they weren't completely unfamiliar with this custom. Um, but still, you know, it was awkward. The little it kids was. beating their chest, you know. It was um, so awkward. they made fun of it. They made fun of everything. The kids was just <laughs> making fun. They enjoyed making fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The so teachers? everything was comedy to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's mostly because their generation was used to secular school. And then all of these ideologies were forced on them suddenly with it, it didn't make sense to them. So they thought it was funny. And the teacher called in parents, uh, the pr- parents of all the kids and threatened to expel like all the students <laughs> because they were making fun of everything. And Marjan's yeah. dad told the teacher what, Alexis? <laughs> Do you remember? He said, if women's hair was so stimulating, (laughs) you need to shave your mustache. (laughs) The dad actually said that to Marjan's teacher. What we saying is the parents have Marjan's back. They 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 were some ride or die parents. (laughs) Um, Okay, so one day. Hilarious. Oh my goodness. One day Marjan goes home and their maid is crying. The maid's oldest son is 14. At school, he was handed a plastic key painted gold and told that if he does go to war, this is the key to paradise. Wear it around your neck. And when you die, you'll have riches and women in heaven. Turns out the government is recruiting children from poor classes to fight. It's carnage on the front line. Mm -hmm. Um, They give them promises, songs, and then just send them to die. And they're selling these children this story so much so that the children believe it look forward to it they're like ready like to take camp, part yeah except you die at the end yeah and but they're like it's going to be a great thing to die because when i die all these other even better things are going to exactly. happen because it's better than my life right now so they're brainwashing children absolutely um people are starting to be arrested for mysterious reasons people are being followed people are being whipped when um iraq proposes a settlement iran refuses okay Mm-hmm. It turns out the Iranian regime needs the war to kind of cleanse its own internal conflicts. Mm-hmm. And I'm I mean, I'm getting this from Marjan's point of view, just to be clear. Right. So the war allows the Iranian regime to attack the rebels within and blame it on Iraq. So when Iraq wants this portion of peace, it's like uh, uh-uh, we still got business inside that we got to take care of. So we won't be held to this forced peace. Mm hmm. <sighs> Good grief. During this conflict, the Germans sell chemical weapons to both Iran and Iraq. You know, it reminded me of the cartels who sell drugs to um, gangs that fight each other. But yeah. in the end, the cartel still gets the money. So they yeah. don't care. So that's how it was. The Germans would sell chemical weapons to both Iran and Iraq. And then the injured are treated in Germany. So they're like veritable human guinea pigs. Yeah. So I'm selling you this and I want to see what's going to happen. So you just send your people back to me and I'll treat them. It's a mess. The borders are closed for three years. No one with children abroad is allowed to see them. People like Marjan's uncle, whose son is alone abroad. He's only 15 years old. Can't see their parents. Marjan's uncle to uh, your theme of the week about surviving crisis. He has bombs going off around him all the time and it's messing with his nerves. He's having heart attacks. He has his third heart attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's deemed that he needs heart surgery in England. But that visa must be approved by the hospital's director. When the uncle's wife goes to meet the director, she finds that it's her former window washer. All he had to do to be a hospital director was grow a, grow a beard and align himself to the regime. And now he's the director at a hospital and in charge of whether her husband lives or dies. He don't give her the visa. So Marjan's dad goes to see an old friend, gives him $200 to make a fake passport. In the friend's basement, that friend's basement, Uh, was hiding an 18 year old girl the same age as the friend's daughter who had fleed with her mother so it's again a situation where he saw a girl who needed help that reminded him of his daughter and he told her listen you can hide in my basement he has that like fatherly love for her Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um so the uncle awakes at the hospital and he's crying he wants to see his son even if it's for the last time a few days later the girl that was hiding in the friend's basement is spotted through the window arrested and executed the friend's place is ransacked. Ooh. He was never able to make the passports. Marjane's uncle is buried three weeks later, the same day his real passport arrives. He was never able to see his son. Mm. We learn later, this is heavy, warning, 
it's unlawful to kill a virgin. So before executing a girl, she is assaulted by a guardsman. Yeah. Marjane went shopping. Marjane went shopping with a friend when they heard a loud explosion. Iraq had sent a missile to her neighborhood, to Marjan's neighborhood. She rushed home. There was a one in two chance, a 50% chance that the missile had hit her house and killed her family. Uh, her whole family might be gone, her mom, her father, and her grandmother. Um, she spots her mom, though, fortunately. Her mother told her that their building was not hit, but the neighbors was not so fortunate. Their neighbors were Jewish, one of the few Jewish families left in the area, and they'd been inside for the Sabbath. Marjan sees a bracelet on the ground. Her friend had a bracelet given to her by a relative. She sees that bracelet on the ground in the street, still attached to a body part. Mm. No scream could have relieved her frustration and anger, she says. One day, Marjan's parents are like, look, we got great news. <laughs> you know, they're putting on a brave face. Yeah. We're sending you to school in Vienna. Yay. And she like... Okay, and so we're all going to Vienna, and they're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, "We gonna come in a few months, but you yeah. going now?" <laughs> and so she's so her, close her grandmother, to her parents, comes, and her grandmother. She's yeah, very, they close very close to her close. family. So, yeah. I'm sorry, come right? Back. So her grandmother comes over for one last sleepover before Marjan departs, and it's so funny because Marjan is like watching her grandmother get undressed and like into her 90 <laughs> and it's flowers falling out of her bra. Can I just tell you two things about the grandmother and her bra? First of all, she puts flowers in them in the morning so that she smells like Jasmine throughout the day. I kind of thought that was genius. But when she takes off her bra, it's like these sweaty flowers <laughs> falling out of them. And then she puts her boobs in ice water yes! twice a day to keep them firm. <laughs> I'm going to try that. I'm going to try okay, that. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, so they all promise that they'll see her soon. And, you know, she knows they're lying. When they get to the airport, the lines are long, filled with young boys who are forbidden to leave the country after 13. After 13, the boys cannot leave the country. So the parents send them away on their own. On their own. At 12 years old and younger. Um, because their parents don't want to see them become soldiers. It's like, you know, you got a 50, 50 chance out there in the world on your own. But I don't want to send you to almost certain death in the war. Marjan says bye to her parents one last time before entering the gate. She turns around to see them go. They were smiling when they knew she was watching. But after she turns around and then looks back, she sees their faces are dark and her mom looks faint. They are tortured inside, sending their only daughter away. She's supposed to stay with her mom's best friend in Vienna, uh, the friend's husband and their daughter. And um, in Iran, the husband had been a big time executive and the wife was his secretary. But in Vienna, he was nobody. His wife was a hairdresser. They fought constantly about money every day. And the wife seemed evil, too. She did. After she really weeks, did. <laughs> yeah. After a few weeks, they sent Marjan to a boarding school ran by nuns. When she arrived, there was one bright side. She could shop at Aldi's like an adult. <laughs> <laughs> she so was so happy time, to shop at Aldi's. So by this time, she's like 14 years old, right? And so she is like free. And she's like, oh, I'm a big girl now. I just don't understand why yeah. the, the, um, the, um, the friend didn't care for her. I don't, I don't understand that. Yeah. But the mom's friend? Yeah, the mom's friend. She accepted her. But like, you got to you getting ready to go out to this um, nunnery place. And maybe it was money. Maybe she can afford to care for two kids. But anyway, so she's in now a boarding school. Mm-hmm. Her dorm mate is German and takes her home with her one holiday break so that Marjan won't be alone over the holidays. Marjan meets the roommate's family who are nothing like anything she's known. The dad wears leather pants and the mom (laughs) has a mustache, (laughs) but they're kind. And the entire family, even extended family, takes a sincere interest in Marjan. She feels like she has a second set of parents. But unfortunately, after this trip, she never sees them again. One day, the nun, the head nun, makes a comment about Iranians not having any manners. And Sir Marjan makes a comment at her about nuns being prostitutes before they become nuns. <laughs> she she, she is had a comeback. <laughs> yeah. The head nun sends a letter to her parents saying that she stole a jar of yogurt um, and instead of facing discipline, chose to leave. A blatant lie. Fortunately, blatant. Marjan's parents are like, she don't even like yogurt. So they know it's a lie. Um, Marshawn begins a very lonely path at this point as an only child of an immigrant family um, from a third world country. Um, and she starts a new school, makes new friends with all this like baggage on her or mm-hmm. following her. 
When she graduates, she lives in a boarding house with, I think, like eight men, all homosexuals. Yep. Her mother comes to visit her for about 20 days and they have disjointed conversations about Marjan's current life and everything she's left back home. Still, her mother's visit fortifies her and Mar- Marjan feels less lonely, less needy for friends. But there is one friend she spends a lot of time with, her quote unquote boyfriend, Enrique. She thinks he might be the one. But he's not because he's gay. (laughs) She later meets Marcus. He's a thespian and they date for two years before she catches him in bed with another woman. Listen, listen. He kicks her out. How did that happen? I I mean, she 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 catches them, calls them names. And he goes, well, if that's how it is, get out. And I never want to see you again. They dated for two years. Can I just say I'm confused? I I am beyond confused because that was Uh, ridiculous. She was like, you know, good so so. He said, if you feel like that, you can get out. <laughs> Alexis, she never sees him again. Ever. They ever. dated for two years. Two. Yeah, she never sees him again after this. Okay. So uh, during this time, she also had begun secretly selling drugs, but that was mostly to make friends. <laughs> She wasn't really making no money. She wasn't making no money. Oh, it. It's not funny, but you but know. But no, listen, that was that no good boyfriend that sent her down there. Yeah. She learned he was a user. He, yeah, she sees the signs later that he was never any good. Right. So, but he was her one emotional support and now he's gone. She's been in Vienna for four years and has nothing to show for it. No one to show for it. No emotional support. Um, suddenly, the owner of the boarding house she's in And this is another one, not the one that was filled with men. This is like her third one now. She bursts into Marjan's room um, and she's crying, accusing Marjan of stealing a brooch. She sees Marjan as a filthy immigrant, untrustworthy. And this is too much for Marjan right now to take. So she packs her bags and she begins sleeping on the street. Under the clarity of night, she understands more about her and Marcus, their relationship. He was a jerk to begin with. He never loved her. He was weak. He was never going to be the one, but she's still homeless. Technically in the morning, she goes to sleep on a train and this is how she spent more than two months sleeping on the streets or sleeping on the trains in the middle of winter. She smokes discarded cigarette butts found on the concrete. She looks for food and trash cans. Soon she's recognized by the train conductors and tossed out of the trains. She has to bear the elements. She gets sick with a cough. Then she begins spitting blood. And she faints on the middle in the middle of the street. She is um, waking up now in a hospital. Eventually, she's discharged with a diagnosis of extreme bronchitis and told that she's not to smoke another cigarette again. Almost immediately. She's like, oh, I need a cigarette. <laughs> Immediate, <laughs> so, you know, immediately. That's my job. What you going to do? <laughs> yeah. She, she remembers that a friend of her mom lives in Vienna and owes her mom money. So maybe she'll give me the money she owes my mom because I need money because I'm homeless. She goes to see the friend and buy some miracle. The friend is like, oh, sure. Here, here, baby, here the money I owe your mama. <laughs> Even the mom was like, when she visited that one time back in the day, was like, go see my friend and see if she'll give you her money that she owe me. <laughs> so her mom would have been cool with this. And yeah. the friend was happy to do it. Um, in fact, by another miracle, the parents call while Marjan is there because they've been looking for They're her for, for months. months. She's been yeah. missing. Mm-hmm. So they ask her to come home. Oh. They they love her. They miss her. They won't ask any questions. Just come home. She returns home. The streets of her home are now filled with like commemoration monuments for the martyrs and even advertisements encouraging young people to become martyrs themselves. Her Man. old girlfriend seems shallow and silly to her now. One friend, though, a boy she used to play with in the middle of the street um, constantly is now missing an arm and a leg. She goes to see him. She is at first shocked by his condition. He's in a wheelchair, of course. Um, But they joke and laugh together and his spirit is positive and it teaches her a lesson. We can only feel sorry for ourselves when our misfortunes are still supportable. Once this limit is crossed, the only way to bear the unbearable is to laugh at it. The war is over and Marjan's father sits down to tell her a story. At the end of the war, Iranian combats with the blessing of Saddam Hussein tried to free some Iranians from the Islamic regime. However, when they entered, they entered through the Iraqi border, the same Iraq who had been bombing the Iranians for like four to eight years or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people killed the combatants, these combatants that came to free them. 
But then the regime becomes afraid because if the combatants had succeeded, they would have freed political prisoners, which were the true threat to the government. So the state decides to open the prisons and execute these political prisoners mm. for good measure. Tens of thousands of people were killed. Overall, the victims of the war amounted to, to, to between 500,000 and a million persons. This did not count those disabled by the war, like Marjan's friend, ravaged by chemical weapons, those who lost their minds from the explosions, the orphans, the widows, the refugees, the material destruction. So this war, war is really, war swallow everything. Yep. Wars swallow everything. So feeling ashamed to tell her family about her troubles, she becomes depressed with no one really to confide in because she's like, my problems are basically first world problems. Yeah, I was homeless. I was spitting up blood. I was lonely, but I wasn't in a war. That's a lesson there. Like your problems, problems are relative. OK, yep. your problems count. Don't compare your problems to other people's problems. Talk about them. OK, um, so she sees one psychiatrist after another. And these psychiatrists, this is these the same psychiatrists that. Um, <laughs> yes. Janet McDonald must have went to the in Project Girl. Same one. For context, see our last episode. <laughs> yeah, yes. they're useless. I was like, mm -hmm. why? Why are you in this profession? Yes. But maybe because they were men and she was a woman, too, I thought. Yeah. But anyway, they're like dismissive. And ugh. the final one is like, oh, you know what you need? Drugs. <laughs> so he gives her <laughs> drugs, which. Honestly, today, a lot of psychiatrists feel like that's a cane to lean on to. Mm -hmm. um, although sometimes, you know, that's sometimes cool, but you need them. This was dismissive and the drugs keep her in a trance. But when they wear off, she feels empty and alone. Um, she has nothing. She's a Westerner in her eyes um, in Iran and Iranian in the West. So she has no identity. She didn't feel like she knew why she was living. So while her parents are on vacation for 10 days, she decides to take her own life. She drinks half a bottle of vodka and slits her wrist with a fruit knife. The cut is so small <laughs> that the blood coagulates and she's just sitting in a hot bathtub like, well, this is now a spa day. This is garbage. <laughs> so that was so the she instruction goes, she got. Yes. Cut your wrist. I don't know. What did she watch it on something and then hop in the uh, tub? <laughs> yep. Ridiculous. Yep. So she um, decides, I'm going to take all of my antidepressants and go to bed. And she does that. Um, she still did not die, though. Instead, she suffers hours of hallucinations. In the comic book, giant rats are jumping through her window and writhing on the floor. She's terrified in a corner. In the end, it seems she was not meant to die, she says. Yeah. She decides to live life with renewed gusto. She shaves the hair off of her body, not her head, just, you know, above her lip and legs and <laughs> armpits and stuff, <laughs> like a true lady. <laughs> and she true gets new lady. clothes. She perms her hair. She wears makeup. She exercises because a healthy mind must live in a healthy body. And she even becomes an aerobics instructor. During this time of renewal, it's she the 80s, also, baby. Um, it's the 80s. <laughs> it's the, she probably teaches jazz or uh -huh, uh -huh. She also meets new friends, and one of them is Roxana. So at a party at Roxana's house, a guy starts chatting up Marjan. Uh, Roxanne <laughs> warns Marjan that he's a ladies' man. Be careful. Well, it turns out Roxanne's best friend just wanted to date the guy. And so Marjan ain't paying her no attention. She starts talking to the guy, he starts talking to her, and they start talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> he only has eyes for her at the party. He chats her up and tells her all about the war and how he and a friend survived by climbing a mountain and eating snow. She's captivated by his bravery and his kindness. Aww. He sees in her a lost lightheartedness and she sees in him a war she had escaped. They almost immediately began planning their futures together. The guy's name is Riza and he's dreamed of living in Europe or the United States, which like... Uh, Marjan is like, I just got here. I ain't trying to leave again yet. Well, fortunately, obtaining a visa is very hard. So to pass the time, they both study um, to take the national test, which you need to pass in order to enter a university. They both pass. But in order to be allowed in school, they also need to pass an ideology test. In front of a man in one room, Marjan admits that while she was in Vienna, she did not wear the veil. She does talk to God, but not in Arabic, since Persians don't really speak Arabic. Um, and so she talks to him in a language she understands from the heart. It turns out that he appreciated this man that's judging her, appreciates her honesty, and she's allowed to attend uh, university. One day she's like at a public market or in the street and she's wearing lipstick, right? Because she wants her new boyfriend to see her wearing lipstick and looking cute. Um, but then she sees like these 
it's almost like secret agents for the uh, Islamic regime. Anyway, they go through the streets telling people what they are and are not supposed to do. And they'll arrest you on the spot. So she tells him, brother, a man over there um, harassed me. And the guy goes, sister, show me where he is and we'll pick him up. So she's trying to distract him away from her lipstick. And they pick up the guy and take him off in a car. I thought uh, this was so cruel. I did too. I'm like, this we're, is terrible. We're, what are they going to do to that innocent exactly. man? Exactly. Why isn't anybody there to judge her accordingly? I know. Even her boyfriend her is like, boyfriend. Oh, good thinking. That's my boo. You know, she's slick. <laughs> but her grandmother yells at her for the first time ever and is disgusted by her. She During said, a religious lecture at university. The grandmother mm-hmm. said, remember your uncle, remember all your grandfather. Yeah. You have all these people in your family and you behave cowardly. She called her a bad word. Too. <laughs> yeah, my grandma wasn't playing. She was furious. Um, during a religious lecture at the university, Marjan challenges the speaker. He has said that their veils are too short and that their jeans are too loose because loose jeans are all the rage in Western um, civilizations. And, you know, we are here in Iran civilization. You need to dress like us. And so she stands up and she's like, um, if our veils are any longer, it's going to impede on our artistry. And we're in art school. And if our <laughs> jeans are supposed to be modest, then they sh- modesty isn't dictated by current fashion. So is it a fashion choice or is it a choice based on our faith? The director of, co- of the college asked to speak with Marjan privately. It turns out it was the same man that interviewed her for the ideology test, the one who appreciated her honesty. And he's going to give her one more chance by allowing mm. her to design the school uniforms. That was huge. Mm-hmm. Although she ain't got much to work with because, you know, the government kind of decided to uniform for everybody. But, you know, she can raise the veil or lower it or whatever. <laughs> so um, <laughs> the rules on modesty make it really awkward during this time. And I thought she did a great job at explaining how illogical scenarios came about because of these rules. So artists would be sketching women <laughs> wearing a full like tent cloth uh, like veil from head to toe <laughs> artists that were say? used to sketching nudes to learn the body shape now has to sketch like drape she said we got really good at drawing drapes though um one time she was running for the bus because she was late and some um like police kind of yeah. stopped her and was like i'm so sorry but the when you run you know your butt behaves in a way that is indecent she's like well stop looking at my butt <laughs> That was like, and now I'm seriously, late. Thanks. Seriously, the way you run, she said they were calling, saying, "Sister, sister, sister, yeah, sister, stop running, please." She's like, Your what butt is jiggling. <laughs> that was so like she missed that bus. Your butt is moving too much. <laughs> seriously, stop yep. looking at my butt. <laughs> and she must have yelled so loud they were too shocked to arrest her. But women could be arrested for showing their wrists, laughing too loud, having a Walkman. Marjan found friends who shared her sensibilities, though, and they formed this tight clique where they dated. uh, They threw mixed gender parties. They danced. They drank alcohol. They played cards and they laughed loudly. The police would often break up these parties, call their parents and demand money for the kids release. The parents happily paid because they, too, had rebel hearts. But this meant that in able to walk these lines, you had to come from a family that was kind of upper class because they had to have enough disposable income to keep getting you out of prison. (laughs) Yeah. However, one night the police busted in on their party. All the boys ran to the roof. The police followed them, mm. and one boy fell off the roof to his death. Uh, death. The officers laughed while the kids cried. Some said they were too afraid to party again, but the next day they had an even bigger party out of spite. Riza, Marjan's boyfriend, proposes. They've been dating for two years. Marjan is now 21 years old. Truthfully, it's impossible for them to get to know each other by dating in public because they're not really allowed to date in public. So they only spend time at each other parents' homes. And because they must live together to get to know one another one-on-one, then they have to get married to like get to know each other. (laughs) So Marjan's dad (laughs) takes the couple to dinner and explains three things, Teresa, to the boyfriend. First, it's impossible for my daughter to divorce you in this country unless you agree. So, you know, I hope you agree that we agree that we can both agree on this. Yeah, make sure. Yeah. My wife and I raised her to be completely free. You, therefore, must study outside of the country after you receive your diploma and you will have my full financial support. I was like, dang. Serious. Nice. (laughs) Thirdly, live together as a married couple only for as long as you feel truly happy. (laughs) Later, Marjan's dad tells her that he knew they was going to get divorced all along. They wasn't right for each other. And he was right. 
<laughs> for her wedding, Marjan allows her parents to kind of take over and do whatever they want to do and have the wedding of their dreams. There are 400 people in attendance. It's an all out ball. During the celebrations, Marjan found her mother crying. Her mom wanted her to be emancipated, a free woman, cultured and happy. But here she was getting married at 21 years of age. Um, the night was full of this, this like um, um, juxtaposition of laughter and tears, but mostly wariness. When she returned home with her new husband, Marjan felt trapped instantly. A huge mistake had been made, she thought. After one month of marriage, Marjan and Risa decided to sleep in separate bedrooms. After two months, they went from weekly fights to daily insults. Risa and Marjan were enlisted for a project at the university. They had to design a theme park based on Iranian mythology. This was the only time they didn't fight. They happily threw themselves into the like thesis uh, work. And it was a huge success. They didn't argue again one time while they were working on it. But in the end, the myth a lot, the mythical figures included women without head coverings. <laughs> so it was simply not realistic for this theme part to be brought to fruition. So it was time to face the fact that their marriage too had no future, just like their theme park. That's how they felt. So Risa said, you know, I'm still in love with you, Marjan. And Marjan was like, nope, it's over. It really is over. Mm -hmm. So they divorced. She moved to France. And her parents and beloved grandmother escorted her to the airport. She would only see her grandmother one more time, New Year's Day, before she died. Freedom comes with a price. The end. Before the grandmother died, by the way, Marjan is still alive. The end. <laughs> Let's take a break. Okay. How did you feel about Persepolis and would you recommend this comic book? I enjoyed it. Um, it made me reminisce about reading um, comic books in my youth. I used to read uh, Archie. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, with Betty and Veronica. I remember the biggest thing I learned <laughs> from Betty and Veronica is that um, to have a natural look, a natural look, it requires a little makeup. <laughs> I did enjoy reading Betty and Veronica. Because <laughs> Betty, can I just share That's this real quick? Yeah, Betty please. was like, okay, friend Veronica, we're going to have a go home and do our makeup and be natural. We're going to be really natural today. <laughs> so Betty goes home. She was the blonde. She did herself all up and had a natural look. And Veronica showed up with like nothing on. Like she just washed her face. And she looked a little tired uh -huh. and everything. And <laughs> Betty was like, that is not how you do the natural look. A uh, natural look requires some makeup. So <laughs> I did learn that early on in life, <laughs> reading the comic book. So that's what it reminded me of. And I'm going to try to find that and post it on our social media. That's hilarious. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it reminded me of that. And I really enjoy reading it. Um, the comic book feel this comic book it, it's a comic book it may for sure yeah um it's a graphic novel that's a comic book um it was quick and easy to read and um i learned some stuff it was funny it was sad it was informative i learned a lot about the um islamic revolution so i would definitely recommend this book what about you yes and yes i enjoyed reading it i would you know um, this is such a unique way to tell a nonfiction story. It is. And, and I, yeah. And it educated me on a part of the world. That's one of the oldest civilizations in human history. Right. It told me things I should have already known. And I love that. I've walked away with some knowledge and it's made me want to, um, broaden my understanding of the middle East area yes. and specifically, um, yeah, yeah, Iran, Iraq, and the cultural differences. I want to start defining these areas not by their wars and conflicts, but by the people. When I think of that area, I want to think of the people before I think of their conflicts. So yeah. I love that. And the way she told uh, these stories was like, um, yeah, I mean, I just loved it. Yeah, I just loved it. I'm looking through the pages now and these drawings are just black and white. She so she's a graphic um, designer. She illustrated this book and wrote the copy. This is a huge talent. It, so. it is. It is. I yeah. was thinking, I said, let me look. Did she also illustrate? But yeah, she did. Yes. Like, the way she so cool. shows herself going through um, um, 
um, adolescent, what is it called? Yeah, Puberty. she was not kind to herself. <laughs> she was often the less attractive one in all of these little squares. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but it was it was very well done. Very well yeah. done. I, and she's beautiful to me. Uh-huh, so. That picture in the back of the book. I said, but she's such yeah. a, a beautiful woman. Even videos I found of her, I just like her style. She just seems like she was raised to have some confidence. Mm-hmm, exactly, exactly. Even though so she I went through it. I would recommend it. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So that was great. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kari. That's a great recommendation. <laughs> so what are we doing next week? Nothing. We do it. Nothing. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Folks, can I you hear that? I can't I'm dancing. Yeah. I'm so sick of books. <laughs> uh, I'm so sick of books. <laughs> I can't wait to not read a book. Folks. Oh, but you want me to read a book during my break. Go ahead. You'll explain we it. We are going to I ain't going to do it. I'll tell you break. that right now. <laughs> We are going to take a break. I'm going to read a book. Kari's going to take a break. I'm going to read a book for a month, I'm watch apparently. TV. <laughs> and then we'll pick you up the following week. That's what we'll do. Yeah, we're only taking one week off. Um, yeah, it's like Fourth of July weekend. Give us a break. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are coming back. <laughs> Is that July we'll 9th? We'll see you again. Yeah, we'll see you again, listeners, on the 9th of July. Yes. So. <laughs> thank you for listening to Lit Society. Thank you, thank you. We'll be back July 9th, okay? Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Anaria <laughs> and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five star review for our show on Apple Podcasts, along with a comment about why you absolutely love us. We love you too. We love y'all. If you enjoyed what you've heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. Visit Lit Society Pod for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, readers, read something. Okay, my friend.